Hi, this is Father Jim Martin for America Magazine, and I am at a place where I wanted to go for pretty much, I guess, my whole life, certainly my whole Jesuit life. We are at the Sea of Galilee, uh, which is pretty amazing to me. I'm very excited to be here uh, with a good friend of mine. Okay, so this is a highlight of the trip for me. We are at Capernaum, where Jesus definitely lived during his years of public ministry. And we're on the shore of Capernaum. So this is what Jesus saw every day, every day during his public ministry, every day when he was in Capernaum, the Sea of Galilee and all of its beauty. And you can see the surrounding shores, and the towns where he went to preach. Who's to say that Jesus, when he lived in Capernaum, didn't stand right here and wonder about his mission? life. We are at the primacy of Peter's spot, where, after the resurrection, Peter is fishing and sees Jesus preparing a meal on the shore, jumps into the water and says, it is the Lord, and rushes up on the shore. You can imagine that happening right here, at this low level. Here are all the people that have come to see it. And there's a church commemorating the spot where the meal happened, I'll pan around, and it's called the Mensa Christi Church. And inside is the stone upon which, traditionally, Jesus was preparing his supper. So here from the shore of Capernaum is the Mount of the Beatitudes. You can see it, that's the rise in the distance. Not far at all from Jesus' hometown. So here is a beautiful sight called the Seven Springs or the Seven Fountains and the tradition is that this is one of the places where Jesus may have called Peter because this is a natural place to wash your nets. Here we are at Capernaum, the place where Jesus uh, called home during his public ministry and behind me are the ruins of the houses of the town. Uh, to the left is Peter's house and behind me you can see over my shoulder uh, is a 4th century synagogue built on the place where the Capernaum synagogue was where Jesus, when Jesus was here. Uh, you remember that uh, he went into the synagogue to, to preach and uh, cast out a demon from a man immediately. So it's a very historic place. It's wonderful to be here. And it reminds us once again that Jesus, uh, you know, a real human being, uh, a real person uh, in a real place and a real time. And here we are in this real place uh, that God chose to make his home among us. So here we are at St. Peter's house. The Spanish-speaking interpreter just said we are here at a place that's very, very important. And I'll just show you some of the ruins of what's traditionally considered Peter's house at Cafarno. In Jesus' hometown, the ruins of the houses in the place where Jesus made his home in Capernaum, which is pretty amazing. It's great being here at the scene of one of my favorite gospel passages. I love not only the uh, demonstration of Jesus' power uh, in front of the demon, uh, but also the way that uh, the man uh, can barely contain himself. Uh, he knows who Jesus is and he's, a, he's afraid. Uh, we're all afraid sometimes when uh, God comes to us and, and calls to us because we're sometimes afraid of change. Uh, but Jesus is very resolute uh, and drives the demon away. Uh, and, and the man is in his right mind at the end. Uh, it is amazing uh, for the people that, that see it. Um, it's probably very amazing for the man that it happened to. Uh, and it can be amazing in our lives uh, what God can do when we allow God to change us and we're not afraid. Uh, and we allow God to enter into our lives, he can transform us completely. So uh, the man uh, is an example of that. I think our lives are examples of that too in different ways. Uh, and it's great to be here where um, the first occasion of that happened in Christian history. We're still in Capernaum, Jesus' town. And I thought I'd offer a little bit of uh, spiritual reflection on uh, what has come to me in my prayer over the last few days. The first thing is, um, how close some of the towns are and how far apart some of them are. Uh, Capernaum is not far at all from uh, the Mount of the Beatitudes, uh, from the calling of Peter. 
um, and uh, from the multiplication of the loaves. So there's a lot of stuff right within the vicinity of Jesus' hometown, which makes a lot of sense. And it gives a lot of meaning to the gospel, at least more meaning for me. Um, the second thing uh, related to that, though, a lot of the towns are very far apart. So when you hear about uh, someone walking to Jericho or Jesus going from Nazareth to Capernaum, it's pretty far. It's not right next door. Uh, and that also helps us understand the gospel, just understanding these distances. Uh, second of all, uh, it's amazing to me uh, to think of uh, Jesus uh, in this particular place. Uh, and it gives, it gives real resonance to his words. Uh, Jesus was not talking in generalities, uh, you know, when he talked about the birds and, and the seeds and things like that. He wasn't talking about seeds in general or birds in general or clouds in general. He was talking about the birds here, the seeds here, the clouds here that people could, could sort of see and touch uh, and hear. And you can hear some of the birds of the air. Uh, tweeting right now um, and uh, and then the third thing I think is just uh, the mystery of God choosing a particular place uh, uh, a sister friend of mine told me that she was here recently and uh, she looked around and saw how beautiful it was uh, and said you know God you picked a pretty good place uh, so why Jesus would have uh, picked this place and also why Jesus would have come from Nazareth you know where he was a carpenter uh, to the Sea of Tiberias to Lake Galilee um, whatever name you want to call it by, is, is really mysterious. You know, what is it that drew Jesus to to the sea uh, and to this place uh, and to here, right where we're standing, Farnham, to do his ministry? Uh, it's it's um, the same in our lives. We sometimes wonder why God uh, does certain things in our lives and why God, God calls us in certain ways and why God acts in certain ways. Uh, Hi, this is Jim Martin from America Magazine on another of our video pilgrimages. Uh, this one's a little further afield. I'm in, believe it or not, Jerusalem. Uh, and we're at the Jaffa Gate uh, in the Old City. You can see behind me all the beautiful uh, sort of cream-colored stone in Jerusalem stuff. So I'm really happy to be here. I'm here with my friend George Williams, who's a Jesuit at the Christmas Chapel in St. Quentin. And I'm going to take you a little bit around the city today and show you some of the holy sites. This is the eighth station of the cross where Jesus meets the weeping women of Jerusalem. And we were just here with a group of Italian pilgrims who were praying and singing hymns. And you can get a sense of how narrow it is here in the Via Dolorosa. And a sense of the antiquity. I'm going to give you a very quick shot of the narrow streets here. This is the sixth station of the cross. Veronica watches the face of Jesus. So we're in a very holy site here. This is the Church of the Condemnation where Pilate condemned Jesus to die. You can see a lot of the old stones here. And we're right near the Church of the Flagellation. This is the Church of the Flagellation. You see a tour group out here. It's where Jesus was whipped and scourged. And it's a very beautiful courtyard you can see. And it leads back to the Church of the Condemnation by Pilate. And this is the beginning of the Stations of the Cross. So here's an amazing place. I've wanted to see this all my life. This is the Pool of Bethesda, where Jesus healed the paralytic man. Jesus said, do you want to be made well? And the man said, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while making my way, someone steps down ahead of me. And Jesus says, stand up, take up your mat and walk. It's pretty overwhelming being in a place that we know Jesus was at. This needs no explanation, the Garden of Gethsemane. You can see the walls of Jerusalem in the background. 
And you can see how very old the trees are here. Hi, so we just climbed the Mount of Olives and uh, we just saw Dominus Flava, the uh, church where Christ wept. And we're on our way to the Dome of the Ascension. Uh, on the east side of this mountain is Bethpage, uh, with which Jesus visited very frequently. And uh, if I've learned one thing from this trip, it's that Jesus and the disciples were probably very fit from climbing all these hills. And our guidebook by Jerome Murphy O'Connor says that Jesus on his way to Bethany to visit Mary and Martha would almost have surely come up this way. He also spent time on the Mount of Olives with his disciples. And there's a church up here called Dominus Flavit, which means Christ weeps. And he wept for the future of Jerusalem. But it's a beautiful view from up here. We just saw the uh, Church of the Ascension and saw traditionally the uh, two footprints where Jesus uh, stood before he ascended. So that's the end of our first day's pilgrimage. Uh, we're up here on the top of the Mount of Olives. You can see Jerusalem in the background. To the Holy Land. And right now I am in the town square of Nazareth, which is a big bustling town. Uh, at the time of Jesus, it was only 200 to 400 people. It's very bustling and messy and noisy. And God comes into our lives, our bustling and messy and noisy lives, just like God came into this bustling, messy world here in Nazareth during Mary's lifetime. Just outside of Nazareth is the small town of Cana, the site of Jesus' traditional first miracle, the turning of the water into wine at the wedding feast. We visited a church there where we all renewed our vows, whether we were married, single, vowed, or religious. It was a wonderful way of once again saying yes to God. We're in the ruins of a Byzantine church that was built over a house from the first century that tradition has it is the house of the Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. And one of the things in the Holy Land that uh, sort of buttresses these claims for authenticity uh, is the fact that a Byzantine church, an early church, uh, was built over a place, which means that very early on, people came uh, to this place out of great devotion. So we may be standing in front of the house of the Holy Family. This is the Basilica of the Annunciation, built over the Grotto of the Annunciation, the place where, by tradition, the angel Gabriel met Mary. You know, Mary's experience with the angel is very much like our experience with God. God takes the initiative, as God does with Mary, and Mary questions and says, how can this be? The angel Gabriel says, look at your cousin Elizabeth. Basically, look what has already happened. Newly confident, Mary is able to say yes to God's request, and something new comes out of that. It's very much like that in our own lives. Something new happens, we say, how can this be? And we look around or find confidence from friends or looking at our past, and we're able to say yes to God, let it be. Hi, I'm Father Jim Martin for America Magazine, and uh, this is a continuing series in our pilgrimages. Uh, I am, believe it or not, in Bethlehem, a place that I've always wanted to come to. And uh, we're starting our tour here at Shepherd's Field. Uh, obviously the place where the shepherds were watching their flocks at night uh, before the nativity. And so I'll tell you a little bit about Shepherd's Field later when we see it, uh, and more about Bethlehem throughout this video. So we are here in Shepherd's Field in the ruins of a 3rd, 4th, or 5th century Byzantine monastery. It's quite beautiful. And you can see a little bit of the, the ruins here. They've excavated it and uh, have turned it into a nice chapel. And uh, right as we were coming in, there were some Italians in a smaller chapel, a little further up the hill, saying mass. But this is quite impressive. They have a great deal of archaeological digs here going on right now. And there is the famous Jerusalem cross that you see everywhere in the city. So it's quite peaceful here in Shepherd's Field. And our guidebook, written by Jerome Murphy O'Connor, the eminent biblical scholar, says that it's unlikely that this place has any historical significance, but uh, 
as I always like to say, my general theological view on these things is you never know. So certainly there are shepherds around here, and uh, if they were overlooking Bethlehem on the night of the Nativity, this is some of the landscape that they would have seen. So we have come from Shepherd's Field, and now we are going to Herodian, which was Herod's palace, Herod the Great. And uh, this is a stunning view of the Judean desert. And you get a sense of how dry it is here, and also uh, Jesus' time in the desert. And I'll give you a quick look at the mountain that Herod's palace is on. So you can see, dominates the landscape. And that's where we're going to go. So we have climbed all the way up to the top of Herodian, Herod's mountain fortress. Our guidebook, Jerome Murphy O'Connor's guidebook, says that the idea of a fortress and palace was unique in this time. And you can see the archaeological digs that are going on. There was a several towers, courtyard, living quarters, Roman baths. Quite impressive. And uh, Herod, of course, was not a beloved figure in Christian history. And we're coming to see the seat of his power. So here's a place I thought I would never come. We are in the, Jude the Judean desert. We are on our way to St. George Monastery, which you can barely see down there. It's located on the hills. And we are right in the middle of the desert and about to go to the monastery on our way to Jericho. We decided to take a little road trip. And I keep thinking of Jesus out here in the desert, which is quite hot. So here we are at St. George Monastery. And to give you a sense of the place, there's the sign and there's the monastery. And we're going to climb up there. So we took a bit of a side trip to Jericho just to see the traditional tree that Zacchaeus is supposed to have climbed up into when he tried to see Jesus who was walking through Jericho. So I've always wanted to see this and here it is and uh, they say it's 2,000 years old and there's a branch that, who knows, maybe Zacchaeus perched on. And it's in the middle of this very busy intersection here in downtown Jericho, the oldest city in the world. Hi, so we are here in Manger Square in front of the Church of the Nativity. And uh, rather than film the inside, which was uh, filled with tourists, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about uh, the church uh, and what it's like. Uh, it's rather empty inside, very uh, orthodox with lots of hanging uh, lamps and lanterns. And uh, you, there's a huge line and you wait to go down into a sort of grotto or crypt where you can see the a place where Jesus is traditionally thought to have been born uh, and then the manger. Uh, and there are a lot of people that sort of bend down and kiss it, including myself, uh, as well as the uh, manger. It's very moving and there's a, quite a sort of a press of crowds. And then also under the church, uh, reputed to be the, t the uh, study of St. Jerome uh, and uh, St. Paula uh, and Eustatia, two of his um, friends and helpers. So it's quite different than I expected. It's not a very um, uh, sort of, um, it's very ornate, uh, but it's, it's pretty tumble down. Uh, and it's obviously very old, you know, millions and millions of pilgrims have been here. It's a very simple church actually inside. Uh, so this is the end of our uh, trip to Bethlehem uh, for America Magazine. I'm Father Jim Martin. Uh, God bless you and may the spirit of the Holy Family come into your heart uh, and to your family.